Okay, continuing in Sefer Shmuel Aleph, Perk Base. We're in the middle of Pasuk Chafei. And the last half of that Pasuk, where yeah. after Eli was rebuking his sons, the Pasuk says, Lo Yishmu Lakol Avihem. They did not listen to the voice of their fathers. Because Hashem wanted to kill them. So that's, there's a problem with this, a philosophical problem with that last verse. Because there's a different Pasuk, and we say it on Yom Kippur, that says, Kilo Yachbots Bemos Harosha. Kilo Echafetz. Echafetz, Echafetz, Mos Harosha. Do I want to kill the wicked? Rather do tshuva and return. And I won't have to kill the wicked. Where was it? It's fine, I don't know. Yeah. Alright, well, let's hope it's going to run. Oh, I'll just put it on anyway. So, so that, that's a big contradiction. So the Malvin uh, says a very simple answer. That the, the, the contradiction is it depends. Is it before God's decree or after God's decree? What does that mean? That it comes to a point where Hashem finally makes a decree upon a person that he's supposed to get punished. So once Hashem makes the decree, then Hashem removes from him the pathways of tshuva. Meaning to say, he won't assist him with a spiritual arousal to arouse his heart to, to bring him to the goodness. But rather, he leaves him to his own free will choice by itself. In other words, had this rebuke come before the Xardin, before the decree of punishment, then there would have been a degree of divine inspiration to inspire his heart, that he would be, they would have been able to hear the, the, the voice of their father. But since Hashem wanted them dead already, then that becomes a, a, a closed law and nothing's going to happen. Meaning to say, when God says, I give you a certain amount of time, and God's very long and patient, but it gets to the point Hashem says, I've been patient enough, and uh, you, you understand what you've been doing, and you and really don't want to do any better, so fine. So the decree is made, and now you're left to, on your own. And on your own, you're not going to want to. You're not going to want to improve. So you don't want to improve. You're going to hear rebuke. You're not going to listen. On the other hand, before, before God seals the deal, then if somebody gives you some rebuke, you know, think about it yourself. You do something wrong, your spouse goes over to you and tells you to do something wrong. How come, you know, sometimes you accept the rebuke and you change, and sometimes you don't? So, like, what's that all about? Well, it's a number of factors. But one of the factors, sometimes Hashem helps you. Hashem just helps you to say, oh, just to be agreeable. And to be, and to be honest with yourself and listen to the truth. You have to doubt him for that too. You have to doubt him for Siat Dishmaya that you should have this common sense to listen to people's rebuke. You know, because naturally people don't like to accept rebuke. There's always a million and one excuses and it, it's, it's unbelievable. The resistance people have to rebuke. Okay. So there can be a number of reasons why that's so. And Hashem can give a person a number of opportunities of hearing rebuke. But then it gets to a point where Hashem says, enough already. It's enough already. And uh, now, if, if I, I, many times I would have wanted to help you, and maybe I even did help you. But now the point is, you don't get any more help from me. Now it's on your own. You got a rebuke on your own, you ain't going to do anything about it. And, and there's a degree of Hashem wanting, as it were, the person now to get his punishment. And on a simple level, it's because, okay, you need your tikkun already. I've tried to help you, I've tried to help you, I've tried to help you the nice way the way that you don't have to suffer, and that way doesn't work. All right, so we're going to have to help you the other way. And, and certain things, the tikkun only comes after your death. And Chafni and Pinchas, you know, Hashem was patient enough, and then Hashem said, okay, now, now I want them dead. They have, to, they have to leave this world already. And that, then they'll get their ultimate tikkun in that way. That's interesting, the Radak gives a whole long explanation that sounds, you know, awfully close to this, and then at the end he says, and our rabbis uh, answer the question by saying this is before the decree and this after the decree, which would might be implying what he's saying is different, but really it seems to be saying very similar. He says it's, it's no different than the idea of Ayechazek Hashem, a slave Paro, that Hashem hardened Paro's heart. And 
so the way the Radak explains, which isn't so different than the uh, than the Malbim, is that when a person uh, continues to sin, so Hashem holds back from him the ways of tshuva until he gets his punishment, and that others should see and be afraid. Right, so there's another aspect to that. But the wicked, let's say, who aren't that wicked enough, they haven't sinned that much, so there's ways of tshuva that are still open if he wants to do tshuva. And even if, he's, if he does a lot of averis, if he's done a lot of averis, but if he comes back with his whole heart, Hashem will, uh, will show to the world that if a person does tshuva, things can be better. But Hashem really knows what's inside people. And this is what the Radak adds that is a little bit new. He, he can look inside. Sometimes people do tshuva, but not sincerely. They're doing tshuva because they, need, they, they just don't want to get punished. But really, they don't care at all. So the Malam says Hashem is the one who can search all hearts, and he knows the truth. And he saw in the sons of Eli that their hearts were not wholesome to Hashem. And even if they would listen to their father's rebuke, and they go away from their, their bad paths, Hashem knew that, he wouldn't, that they weren't going to do it with a full heart. And therefore, he wanted them not to listen to it, the Father's voice so he could punish them and they could die. Why? So that people should say, Oh, these Rishoyim, they talk got their punishment. And Hashem was just in what he did. So it's a great balancing act that Hashem has to perform. Because Hashem knows if you're going to be sincere in your tshuva or not. If you're just saying, Okay, I'll do tshuva. And you'll technically on the outside, you know, do enough just so you won't get hit by the letter of the law. But it's still, you know, as a coin, as a coin, you really have to show, and what's most important, a coin ha- more than anyone else has to show his heart is for Hashem. The coin has to show love for Hashem and love for the Jewish people. Obviously, they didn't, uh, the way the Radak is learning at least, um, you know, that, that didn't seem to be there. And therefore, even if they did tshuva, it would be a superficial tshuva, which really w- would not have helped at all. So since he saw they really weren't into doing the right thing no matter what, so Hashem said, okay. The people need to see others for their benefit need to see as pe- the people themselves were talking bad about them. So now if they get punished, no one's going to complain. They're going to say, oh, Hashem is just. Hashem is right. So therefore, you know, the general rule we get out of both commentaries is, you know, when, when, you, when you see the messages are coming, do tshuva. And think long and hard to sincerely return to Hashem. Then Hashem will help you. But uh, anything else than that, you can't really count on Hashem's help. And, and most likely, you know, you're not going to be able to uh, be able to do that shuv, and things will not work out very well for you. Okay, so that's the explanation over there. Now the next pasuk, and then we, we kind of finish a section. You know, it's a long parak still, but at least finish the section. And for the third time, it says in pasuk chafav, as opposed to the children of Eli who didn't listen, Nar Shmuel holech vegadel mod. But Shmuel, the young man, Shmuel again, the nar, even though he was a nar. He still was growing and great, and he was good. Gam im Hashem vegam im anashim. Also with Hashem and also with people. The first two times it mentions he was close with Hashem. Now he has people. Why? Because now it's, 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 it's paralleling it, contrasting it to the Bnei Eli. The Bnei Eli are now saying how people did not like the Bnei Eli. How people were speaking against Eli. It was bad enough that they were doing averse against Hashem. They were now doing, people were recognizing it. It was bad against people. So in contrast to them, that, that Shmuel was the kind of person, not only was he devoted to his, in, in, his, um, in his work to Hashem, but other people loved him as well. So as slowly, slowly, we're beginning to see the shift in power is going to happen. The, the old regime is old and not loved by the people, and there, there's no continuity of spirituality coming from the, B'nai, from the house of Eli. Shmuel is the emerging new star, and as, as always, Hashem always prepares the refuah before the makkah. Hashem prepares the healing before the punishment. And we're going to see very soon how it's going to be a terrible, terrible blow to the Jewish people. Terrible blow. And that's what has to happen to clear the path for the emergence of the new light. Which now leads us to the peace from Rav Tzado. Okay, so you just pass these around for me. Double sided here. And this piece is from uh, the Rashise Loyla. 
Rav Sadok wrote a lot of Shvarim. It's called Rasisa Laila, and it's Os Chaf Dalid. And if any of you who are listening or watching want a copy of it, you can email me, and I will happily send you one. It's a long piece. I don't know how much this will get through today. But he's going to shed a new light. Right now, you look in the Chaf Nipichas, you think they're rotten creeps. So, I can't quite let it go with that. So, if you look at where it says on the upper right hand side, Rusise Loilo. And let's go through it. It's a very, very beautiful piece. He says, The order of how Hashem arranged the creation. In the beginning, it's dark. And then it gets light. It's Gmorn Shabbos. And we know that. That's the way it is in all the days of the world. There's no light that's revealed. But only from a previous darkness. You know, from the beginning of creation. It was night, it was day, the first, first day. One day. Always it was dark. In Judaism, the dark, the night always precedes the day. In every aspect of Yiddishkeit, there isn't an aspect of Yiddishkeit where there isn't dark before light. That's, that's the way it has to be. Um, for many reasons, but one thing's for sure, the light is so much more clear when you see the darkness first. When you see all that is false, then the truth becomes much more true in people's eyes. This is a rule that always has to happen. Terech Mashal, Matan Torah, Kidem Lo Yitzis Mitzrayim. Before the going out of uh, giving the Torah, the Jews had to leave Egypt. They had to be in Egypt. It's pretty dark in Egypt. You know, a lot of darkness to have the light of Torah. Right? How people can't appreciate the light if you're not in the dark. If everything's going fine, then how do you appreciate the light? Uh, okay. etc. etc. Ubinian base And what about the building of the base of Migdash? Where did that come from? <coughs> By the conquering of the ark that the Plishtim took, which we're coming up to in the next couple chapters. Because that's the total opposite. In other words, the darkness before the light that we're moving now into this next era of Jewish history. The next light's going to be the base of Migdash. That's going to be a beautiful light. There has to be a darkness before that light. And that was when the Philistines had the chutzpah after defeating the Jews in battle to take the holy ark of the Jewish people. It's very dark. Right? And now, and now how did that happen? In was that, what was the cause of that? Chet b'nei Eli. The sins of the children of Eli. And now here's the, the whole word. He compares Chafni and Pinchas to Nodav and Avihu. Their death. They caused Nodav and Avihu, their death, when they brought the strange fire. It caused a holiness to the Mishkan. As our, as our rabbis tell us on the Pasuk, it says, And they'll be sanctified in my honor. He's going to explain this. And now he says, "V'chein kol dover mitol choshech yotzei or shumamish ha'hefach osa choshech bein bedores bein beprati nefoshes." So it is uh, that there must be from the darkness comes the light, which is mamish the opposite. And this light will has to this darkness has to come in terms of generations in history, and also in persons' pers- private lives. Them. This is a rule that can never be changed. If you expect success and light, forget it. There's got to be darkness before this. It just is not. You're trying to defy nature and it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist on a personal and in a national level. We want Mashiach to come. Baby, it's going to be dark before the Mashiach comes. And, and since Mashiach is the ultimate light, the ultimate of ultimate of lights, is going to be the ultimate of ultimate of darknesses. Where you're just not going to see Hashem at all. You're going to not believe that there's Hashem at all. And then, and generally speaking, before that light's going to come. That's the rule. To the degree that the light has to come, the darkness has to be so great. So Hashem is going to give us a Torah at Sinai, you know what kind of light that was? There's going to be a tremendous amount of darkness before that. And that was the, the exile in Egypt for 210 years was terribly dark. But then incredible light. 
It goes back and forth through history. So it means after after incredible light, there has to be darkness again. Didn't say that. But that's the way. It's no, there. did not say that. The Jewish people will hold on to the light and appreciate the light. There doesn't have to be any more darkness. We're not getting to the equation of how you lose the light. That's another story. But for light to come, there has to be darkness first. Once you have the light, a wise person would appreciate the light, would hold on to the light. If you don't hold on to the light, it's a different story. And there's other rules that come into play. You don't want the light, you're not happy with the light, then Hashem has to take the light away. When the light goes away, then the darkness comes by itself back. That's the rule. That's the rule. You have a holocaust that's very dark, Hashem gives you back Eretz Yisrael. Now that Holocaust was a fraction of what was, uh, and with all due respect to Holocaust survivors, the Holocaust was a fraction of what happened in Egypt. The Holocaust was six years. Egypt was uh, over a hundred years of bitter, bitter, 210 years, but about a hundred years of intense, right? And, and, and you have to remember, another aspect you want to realize, the Holocaust did not affect all of world Jewry. There was a great percentage who weren't affected at all. Jews in North America were not affected at all by it. Jews near to Israel were not affected at all by it. But in Egypt, every Jew was affected. There was nobody who wasn't affected. Tribal Levi, okay, but they were still there. So since it was so bad, the, the light was so much greater. Not taking away from uh, having near to Israel now, but Kabbalah Satar, I think, was a bigger thing. So that, that's a rule. So therefore, we got to see you know, like where that darkness is coming from and what's leading to that darkness. So let's come back here. Now he explains a beautiful idea with the Mishkan. The Guf Inyan Mishkan, whom is Bea, the Seder Avoda, who. The whole idea of having a Mishkan, an altar, and the whole service we have. Who Haradas Hashchina Betachtonim. It's bringing down Hashem Shechina into the lower world. The Seder Hatikunim Vekapara Shachatoim. And this whole order, it's a whole order of repairs and atonements of sins and cleaning up all filth that Jewish people have. And beautifying and adorning the, the bride. That the Mishkan is this idea of making the bride beautiful before the, the groom. And that happens, that gets drawn forth from Hashem bringing the Shechina, His presence down amongst us. Once there's a revelation of the Shekhin in the hearts of the Jewish people, consequently all dirt must get cleaned. And all the uh, darkness and the evil amongst that comes with it gets pushed away from the light. And that's the Mishkan, Ratzlomer, Mokom Shechina, the place of the Shechina. There was the concept of Mishkan as opposed to Mikdosh. There's two concepts here. We learn in the Chumash about the Mishkan. We didn't learn anything about the base of Mikdosh. They're two separate structures with two different ideas that have to be merged. They're not the same? No. The Mishkan was one thing, and after a while, when Eretz Hashem said, it's the end of the Mishkan, and now we're building a Mikdosh a permanent temple. The Mishkan was an itinerant place of holiness. The Mikdash was a permanent place of holiness. The, the size was different. A lot of things were different. The Torah only goes into great deal to describe the Mishkan. There was no base on Mikdash built in the Torah. Base on Mikdash was built in, in Sefer uh, Melachim. It's two different structures, two different ideas that come out of it that will merge. That's what he's going to explain over here. Yes? So in, the, in the Torah, it gives Gives a, uh, a lot of detail what the Mishkan is, the size, what the built, where the instructions are. You have to look in the in the in the in the in the Navi. Look in the Navi. Tells you how that was built, right? Now, so, so the, the idea, in other words, so the idea of Mishkan is cleansing, purifying, and he'll explain more later on. Of a Mikdash, but Mikdash. What does the word Mishkan mean? Mishkan means Shochain to dwell. Hashem's presence is dwelling amongst you. That's one concept. Mikdash, what does the word Mikdash mean? Kodesh, holy. Ratzalemer, Mokam Kedushahu. It's a place of holiness. Humanish Hefach Mishkan. That's the opposite concept of a Mishkan. The Kedusha, what does Kedusha mean? Ratzalemer, Havdolav, Rasha. Kedusha means separation. 
being separated from the mundane, beyond the simplistic physical. Shudover nivdo. It's something separate. Have shechina. Shechina means who has shochen and mischaber nivdo. Hashem is dwelling and connected, and there is no separation. As it says in Vayikra, Hashem is hashochen itam betoch tumata. That the, uh, the oh man missing over there. Uh, tumosam. That Hashem dwells amongst them even amidst their impurity. Even if we're tame, the Shechina is still there. Mashenkin Kedusha, which is not the case by Kedusha, who have Dolomitum, it's a separation from Tuma. Remember, the real Mishkan was where? Supposed to be. In everybody's heart. Shechanti Betocham. The real Shechina is supposed to be inside every Jew. And the, and the Mishkan per se is just a symbol of that. So Hashem's, Hashem's presence that can rest in you, even if you're unholy, the presence will rest in you. While a Mikdash, you walk into the base of Mikdash and you're unholy, you get killed. You get chorus. That part, there's, there's conflicting aspects over here. But even though they're conflicting aspects, the next paragraph, Umutsinan Mishkan the Ikri Mikdash, U Mikdash Ikri Mishkan. The morning Aaron says, but when it talks about the Mishkan in the Torah, it still uses descriptions of Mikdash. And when it talks about the Mikdash, it uses description of, of Shokhashina. So it seems that the two terms get combined. The Kulachat, it's really one thing. Ushneim Emes Biyachat, they're both true together, meaning to say, Shakarish Barku Shokhain Betok Bene Shovagam Nivdomehem that Hashem resides amongst the Jews and is still separated from them which he now has to explain Ke'inin Shemuva Betana Dvei Yorab as it explains in the Medrash there it says, the Apostlech says Ani Yoresi Mitoch Simchasi I was afraid, I feared from my joy V'samachti Mitoch Yorosi and had joy from amongst my fear meaning to say Hasimchahu Ish Bereyehu that joy is a, like a person having joy with his friend. It comes out of love. It comes out of socializing and connecting with others. That's what, that's what love is. That's what simcha. Simcha means being connected with others. But fear is from the derech uh, eretz. The... I translated in English such a bad way. The... Uh, respect that, that you have from a greater person that's beyond you in other words there could be a great great holy tzaddik and you're in awe of his presence and you have a tremendous respect and fear for his greatness right it's a tremendous respect on the other hand wouldn't you want to love that person too in other words the idea of love love means there are no barriers love means we're very connected and that has a very positive aspect, but there's also a negative aspect to it. Familiarity breeds contempt. If you really feel so connected to somebody, it's hard for you to put them on a pedestal beyond you. While if you revere someone and respect someone, you can put them on a pedestal beyond you, but it's very hard to feel close with them. Right? So that's a tough act to, to connect the two concepts. And this is really what Judaism requires. And that's what the two concepts are. The Mishkan is the, is the aspect of the love, the aspect of the joy. While the Beis Amigdash is the aspect of the reverence and the fear and the respect. So regard to Hashem, they must both be present. One without the other is not good enough. As it says, that from the, we learned from the book of Ov, the Eov, the year of Levad, maybe Shtus. Reverence and respect alone without love brings foolishness. Where it says in Eov, your fear brought foolishness. That you can do foolish things out of respect. The sim but 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 happiness alone, maybe Kalas Rosh brings lightheadedness. Well the Amra to this the Gemara says for certain people, Mutav Shaloh Lisa, it's better you shouldn't have gone up. In other words, it's certain people, it's better they shouldn't learn Torah. Because it's going to say in a minute, the Torah is the source of joy. And someone who just have Torah without an accompanying amount of fear, 
It's better not to learn Torah sometimes. The Torah never misam chaleiv. The Torah is called the Kudi Shur misam chaleiv. The Torah makes your heart happy. Through Torah you get connected to Hashem. But if you're lacking, more there says if you if you learn Torah, you don't have any years Hashem. Better not to learn. Better not to learn, because that learning will turn out to be very dangerous for you. It's like person example more there someone storing wheat, and to store wheat you have to have a little bit of um, what's the stuff to help it from decomposing. You have to have some to put in a little bit of uh, what's the word preservatives. What if you have to put a bunch of wheat into a <coughs> into a storehouse? You forget to put preservatives in there. So better not to waste your time putting the wheat there. So a person learns Torah without in, in putting in a little year of Hashem, better not to learn Torah. Because Torah makes you feel close with Hashem. That's what it's meant to be. It makes you feel close to Hashem. If you learn respect, it's not good to be too chummy with Hashem. Get too chummy with Hashem, you forget, you forget who's the boss. You forget who's the boss. Oy vavoy. <coughs> so learning Torah alone, without, without realizing... Hashem is still on that pedestal. Hashem is awesome. Hashem is beyond. I love that God, but I respect Him to the nth degree. That's the way <coughs> you have a healthy mix. But one without the other is no good. So that's what learning is. Learning is all about the love of Hashem. That's what the Igle Tal and others say. That really it's wonderful that you should be happy when you're learning. When you're happy when you're learning, the learning goes in. And then you're happy with Hashem. You feel close to Hashem. When you finish learning Torah, you should. The optimal experience is to feel a closeness to Hashem. And you walk out, wow, boy, I feel close with Hashem. Boy, I'm so happy. Right? You've got to be careful, though. Where's the fear? Masha ain't came bit feel, on the other hand, prayer. What about prayer? Nikra, it's called Vinik Dash Tibetok B'nei Yisrael. I am made holy amongst the Jewish people. When ten men get together, the Shechina comes together, and Hashem's holiness comes. That's why Tvila has to be with a congregation. It's a recognition of the holiness. Hashem Yisbarach Nivdal, who. And Hashem is beyond. He's separated. Al Yidei Ribui Hamisachi. When a group of people get together, now that, that, that puts Hashem up on a pedestal. V'chol be'asar Hashchin Tasharye. And whenever there's ten people, the Shchin is there. Shem Koma Shlema de Bnei Adam. You have a full um, uh, um, stature of humanity. Ten men together represent a complete aspect. Ain't Dait and Show. There's our ideas. Their ideas are different. And everyone's opinions are different. When there's ten Jewish souls there, the Shekhinah has to be there. It even comes before. Without any effort on your part, just bring ten men together in a room. Boom, the Shekhinah is ready to be there. And why is that? That's because of the aspect of the holiness of the Mikdash. The Mikdash is a group experience more so than the Mishkan. See, the Mishkan Chana goes by herself. Private. The Mikdash is a whole different aspect over there. And therefore, really, Tefillah really brings out the aspect of what? Yir Hashem. The fear of Hashem. You go to Hashem, you sing Hashem, without you I'm dead. I'm asking from you the most basic things in life. Without you, I know how powerful you are. I know how awesome you are. I can't lift a finger without you. Uh, is that putting you in your right place? And he's way up there. He's way up there. And you're begging him. You're begging him. Hashem. Hashem. You, you've got all the control. You've got all the power. Who am I to come to you? And yet, and yet you've told us that we can. So with that, I have the chutzpah to come and beg for something from you. That's yours, Hashem. That's what he was... Yeah, the whole idea, the whole, the whole halachas. You go into shul. Don't go into a shul laughing and joking and clowning around. You know, you go into a shul with reverence. Nobody talks in a shul. So that's the whole idea why talking isn't allowed in a shul. Because talking is the idea that makes love and friendship. That's not what a shul is all about. People don't get the idea. Shul is not about friendship. 
the shul itself is all reverence and respect. Go into that shul, don't say nothing. And, and, and you're dressed a certain way to show that respect. You don't go in with your t-shirt and jeans before you talk to Hashem. You say, oh, you go, you go in front of the king of all kings. You should be a certain amount scared. Not, not that he's going to be mean to you, but the, uh, the office of God is a very special office. You come with a tremendous reverence and respect. And that's the way it has to be. That's what it has to be. Matovo Alecha Yaakov, Mishkan Right? Etc., etc. On the other hand, on the other hand, Right? The Yachid Ha'osik but Torah, but an individual who learns Torah, Shechina Imo, the Shechina, that the lovable part, is with him. That's according to his understanding alone. Zelk Dusha Mishkan, that's the idea of the Mishkan. That's the idea of the holiness of the Mishkan. Vaumoid, in the tent of meeting. What was the main point of the Mishkan? Sheikarlet vivre Torah was mainly the Torah. Where did Hashem speak to Moshe, give him more commandments from after Sinai? It was there in the Mishkan. It was a place of Torah. The hablita bikdusha zu and the I guess this uh, expression or whatever of kedusha this whole is she Mishkan. It's the name of the Mishkan. Dani Hashem shochein. I'm the one who dwells. Zu ena kavu and it's not permanent. As the rabbis give a similar expression, they ain't Talmidah Chachamim, but Suim Lios Benayim Talmidah Chachamim. That not necessarily of scholars who have children who are scholars. Torah moves around. It doesn't guarantee stay from generation to generation. Sheinu Kviyas Mokam Miyuchad Lavad. It's not a set place. Shu Kedusha Mitzani Schabros Hashem Yisbarach Udvekis. It's only a Kedusha that comes out of the connection and bonding that a person creates. The Yadu these chabras ain't a big And we know connection isn't permanent. It's something that has to be nurtured, and if you don't push it, it falls. He's Iris Avud Vegas Prakam, the arousals of love and attachment that only comes from time to time. but Yira, but what is constant is Yira. Reverence is a constant. Very big ideas he's saying over here. You know, this, this is so important for marriage. This is such important for marriage. You get married what? For simcha? For sure. But the simcha in a marriage is not bequeous, isn't permanent. What really is there, you got married really for the most important reason. Right? We say every, every home is like a mishkan, it's like a mikdash. So you got to remember that the most important part of the marriage is the mikdash is the reverence, the fear. The most important part of the marriage is you brought Hashem is in your, is in your life. And there's a, there's a reverence for the fact that there is a third party very much involved in your marriage. And that's our Kaddish Baruch Hu. And there's a reverence for our Kaddish Baruch Hu. And, and, and there's a focus of reality that you have now that you're married. Now, and, and, that's, and that is the dominant feeling that's the dominant feeling that has to be there the, those feelings of love and all those other guys you know it's not it's always going to be there 24-7 in a marriage now the more that it's there the better but if you want to say how do you how do you stay married don't measure it you know well you know I'm not I don't feel that you know there's so much happiness well there's, there's got to be the reverence is the constant that keeps it going Never, they have to have that that balance. You know, you have certain times in a marriage where you know, you know, just not feeling so in the mood to be so in love with your spouse. Just, it's okay. It's okay. Yeah, maybe we should split up. Whoa, there's God in the picture here. Hang on, hang on. You you guys got a job to do over here. There's 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 there's, there's someone on, there's some there's an entity on a pedestal that we have to focus on. And you guys have to be in this forever. That right now you're not happy with each other because one spouse is fixing up a meat of another spouse. One spouse is saying, why is such a lazy bum? Ooh, the simcha's gone. Oh, I, I thought, well, I got married to you to have fun. You're telling me I have to clean up my, my filthy clothes. Ah, I didn't, I didn't come in for that. 
and then, and then all of a sudden the husband's not making the right amount of money oh, I didn't come in for that well where's the Yira the Yira said you came in here for one reason to have the Tzalem Elohim it's the only reason you got married because you're a garnished and you're a garnished and together with Hashem you'll be something you'll be something Right? So there has to be a reverence. And Hashem says, Hashem says, and you better have reverence for what He says. And Hashem says, even if your husband is unemployed, you have to respect him. And even if your wife is a lazy, good for nothing, didn't make dinner, you have to appreciate her. Why should I? Because God said so. And He's the boss, and you better listen to Him. And you better respect Him. And that's a constant. That's a constant. If you're having love, it depends. It depends how much you work on it. And I'm not saying you can't have love very often, but it's always temporary. What does it mean temporary? If you're not pushing to make it happen, it ain't gonna be there. You know, you have you have to work hard. You know, I have to get in the mood to say, I'm gonna compliment her, I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna do that, I'm gonna respect him, I'm gonna make the effort. And when you do that, then the feelings come. But if you sit back, the love doesn't come by itself. It's a temporary thing. So the Mishkan, so learning like learning Torah. When you learn the Torah and make the effort and you see how beautiful Torah is, then you love Hashem. If you sit back and do nothing, says, Why should I love Hashem? Just working all day long. Why should I love Hashem? The way you really understand the love of Hashem is by learning a Torah. Right? But now you have to learn to fear HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Learn to fear HaKadosh Baruch Hu. you got to pray. And what does the Gemara say? The Rabbi says, Halavai, you should pray all day long. Remember how we explain with the Bovavi. It doesn't have to be only in Shul, but every action you do. You're going into Sir Hashem, please help me that I don't see things that aren't sneistic. Please help me that I buy the food with Shem Shabbos and this and that. And that, that's a reverence to Hashem. Hashem, I know you're the boss and I'm not the boss. That's supposed to be the constant. Even before you learn Torah. Hashem, I'm learning the Torah so that I will fulfill your will. See, when I'm going to do things to show that I love you, I still am going to come into it with a sense of respect. And that's got to be the constant throughout life. While the love and the joy and all these things, you know, we'd like to have it as much as possible and to the degree you make the effort, that's a good thing. But it's not necessarily going to be permanent. So that's the multi-aspects of Mishkan and Mikdosh. That ultimately, the Mishkan, the Mikdosh, these were places that reflected the dual nature of our relationship with Hashem. So in the Mishkan, it was more heavily laden on the Torah aspect because after all the Mishkan was first built when they were in the desert for 40 years they're supposed to be learning Torah all the time but of course there still had to be an element of fear but that was all on a temporary basis that Mishkan was temporary but the final base of Mikdash that's the place the Mamish the place of fear and because that's the Mamish the base of Mikdash is called base to Filosi the place of my prayer the Mishkan was not called base to Filosi it was not called the place of my prayer the, the, the divine presence was there as a place where we're going to connect through Torah more and prayer would be secondary but the Mesa Migas is the ultimate it's, it's Yiras Hashem Otsara the fear of Hashem is the treasure house and of course you have to have love in there too so therefore that's what Mishkan is Mikdash and Mikdash is Mishkan you have to have both aspects one without the other is not good what we'll see next week we'll do the second half of the page he's going to show you how both Nadav and Aveyu and Chofni and Pithras had the aspect of love but not the aspect of fear and because of that through their downfall the Jews would learn to appreciate the aspect of fear and then we can move on to the next step and that's what we're going to explain next week Amir Tzashem let's hope we can remember that thought ok